three to five to seven minute introduction playing the basis of, of your career transition. And then we jump into questions uh, about what, what really made, made a difference for you. And maybe if we we'll go first on that initial slide. So, so uh, as I told before, my name is Mikaya Mashita, and I'm a pro I identify myself as a program evaluator. And um, starting next month, I'll be working as a program analyst for the Peace Corps. Uh, where uh, I will be looking at their safety, volunteer safety data and uh, come up with recommendations and also evaluate their training program. And I'll be working with a group of researchers and also program uh, people to do this work. And before that, uh, for the past six years, from 2013 to until last Friday, uh, I was a senior researcher for uh, research in a small uh, non-profit organization, which was advocacy and uh, membership organization. And it, it was about 20 to 40 staff, whole staff members. Within that organization, there's a small research unit which has three people working. <coughs> and I'm one of them. And I did, uh, I did research to support their advocacy work, meaning getting data to support their advocacy work. But also we had a external funded program evaluation and research project. Uh, when I left last week, uh, I was a co-principal co investigator for the NS National, National Science Foundation funded project. And uh, also we had other projects too. Um, so this career move is kind of the switch for me because uh, before, until Last week, my work mostly focused on education programs, evaluating education programs. But I will be doing more international uh, program evaluation. Uh, and also I'll be working with, uh, this job is also uh, a federal uh, job. So this is the switch from non-profit to a federal mm -hmm. job. So this is uh, where I am now. And Oh, and this, this is the timeline, just to show. And then before 2013, I was working for... Yeah. I was working for a non-profit organization. Actually, that was a government, big government contractor uh, doing uh, evaluation. So, yeah, this is my timeline. And as the you know, question touches upon some of my experiences, I would like to elaborate on that one. <laughs> Ken and I just found out that we should have done slides, so we're not as prepared as. So, so Ken and I are just going to tell our stories. Yeah. I guess for me, my story started. I had been at a company for 19 and a half years, and really thought I was going to retire from there. But things changed when we got acquired. And then, you know, the, it was a whole new culture, a whole new way of doing things. And so I found out that after a, a, a brief transition period that my services were no longer needed. And so I found myself in transition. And I did what most people did. I tried to find a job on my own. And I did that for about you know ten months unsuccessfully, absolutely pulling out my hair, not knowing where my resume was going. You know, I would not hear back. Uh, I had no feedback, and really didn't know what to do. And I hired a career coach, and he recommended this class. I have to tell you, this class was. It was a changing point for me because in my profession, I'm, I was responsible as a program manager to make sure my team was working efficiently. And what I found is like a lot of the employers were like hesitant to even give me an interview seeing that I had been in transition so long because they want to see people who were efficient and effective. And if I can't effectively manage my job search, 
why would they even entrust me to manage huge teams? So I found some challenges there. And again, uh, I think later on, if, are, are we gonna, you have a list of questions yeah. for us that mm -hmm. you're gonna get through. I think, was it the list I saw on the web page? Right, you yeah, know, okay. challenges. Uh, all right, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to the appropriate time. But I would say that the class really helped me in, in several ways, primarily in helping me focus on what was important to the companies, you know, the message that they wanted to hear. What I didn't realize when I first came into transition is that I was actually really self-employed as a salesman peddling my services. And until you understand that, it's kind of hard to really position yourself in a way that you're going to be appealing to the companies. And I think that was one of the things that really, a big turning point for me, once I got into the class and sort of learned the 40 plus way. So, oh, oh and now I, I guess I should uh, tell you that I am. I'm, I'm employed, I'm an insurance agent with the Knights of Columbus. And then the, the executive directorship here is you know, volunteer activity. And I do it because I really believe in the mission and it's really helped me. Hi everyone, I'm Ken Shopman. And four years ago today, I signed up and had my first 45, 40 plus class. Ron and I, Ron Moore and I, were in the class together, exactly started exactly four years ago today. I'm an association executive, which means that I get to work with smart people, sometimes from all around the world, from all around the country, who are subject matter experts in their area, and I'm not. So it's been a fascinating career. Uh, my transition, I think like John and Mika both said, it's, it's, a, it's a humbling experience. Um, it's an educational experience. Um, for me, it was, I re realized too late how the critical importance of being organized and, and owning it yourself, as John mentioned, being sort of your own salesperson. Um, and so by the time I came to 40 plus, quite honestly, I was stale. Uh, I had been out of work for a few months, you know, thought, you know, I was fairly successful in my previous few role. Being two, uh, few being two. Few being four. Okay. Um, and thought, yeah, I know how to do this, you know. But the last time prior, to, I had been in my previous organization 15 years, and prior to that, the things that mattered in search were the quality of the paper that your resume was printed on, you know, <laughs> and the fonts that you used, right. and all that. What the hell is that? Now? And so, and then in those intervening years, uh, something called LinkedIn happened. And while I was the administrator for a LinkedIn group with 5,000 people around the world, I really didn't know how to use it for myself. Mm -hmm. um, so the 40 plus course really helped me uh, understand how to be strategic uh, and own the, the process and develop a plan to execute. Um, I, was, or I organized for 40 plus programs for a couple of years, uh, doing the role that Fred is doing now. Fred, thank you very much. Uh, I'm on the board now of 40 plus. I'm also uh, about a year ago, uh, almost precisely a year ago now, uh, landed another opportunity uh, in the association space. I am the executive director for a small scientific society, the Association of Biomolecular Resource Facilities, whose members operate shared research in, uh, facilities on major campuses all around the country. Uh, it's a small organization. I'm a sole full-time person. We access pieces of other people for uh, mutual services like accounting, technology, meeting, planning, and membership. Um, it's a rewarding experience. I'm looking forward to taking another step uh, back in the association space, perhaps in a little bigger playground. Um, but uh, one of the other outcomes for me in, for the 40 plus experience was understanding more clearly the need to articulate your success. Um, and really to look inward first and identify the things that are truly important to you. And for me, that boiled down to servant leadership. Um, I recognize that you know, sometimes that sounds like a really squishy uh, quality or characteristic characterization of yourself, uh, especially for men. Uh, there's a bit of sexism around that, perhaps. Uh, but for me, it's critically important. And you know, as I look ahead to my next chapter, it's 
definitely going to have to be focused on servant leadership. Um, I'm not someone who comes in and says it's got to be my way or the highway. I really want to build consensus and create things that are value for the community that I work with. So that's enough about me. Just one quick thing because I've, I've had a slide in. Um, <laughs> so this is just a, a, an alternate. You know, we all we, we can talk a lot about resumes, and you probably heard of many different things. This is a, a methodology that was shown to me or, or shared with me in the early part of my search um, when I was working with another group that was really expensive, um, didn't produce results. But the idea here is to create a timeline and then to basically structure this as a self-interview. So these are, these are not your standard interview questions. Tell me about yourself, what's your greatest weakness, yada, yada, yada. Um, these are more, it's an opportunity for you to share a little bit more. And the way I've used this in my search is not with the cover letter, not with the resume, not at that stage, but at the interview stage. It's just a little extra document and insight to share with prospective employers to help you stand out. So again, just a little bit of a Q&A format. It's a little, for me, I structured it as a little bit revealing. So I talk about servant leadership, I talk about some of the things that are important to me, my leadership style, and so forth. Because for the organizations being in the association and nonprofit space, I think it's a little bit more of a personal connection in some respects than in the for-profit community. And so I had to get comfortable with uh, sharing a little bit more about this. So I could I Mika, I just couldn't, you know, you had a slide, I couldn't resist. So yeah. that's a little bit about yeah, me. Ken, you're winning the slide uh, competition you put. Yeah. Is there a template what do you use? Is there a template that you use for that? Actually no, I, I because they only get I paid a lot of money. For them to create it for me, and they only gave it to me in PDF, uh -huh. so I had to mimic it. Sorry if I went on too long there. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I want to go back to it. Okay. And, um, so you said that your um, one transition is going from a nonprofit to federal program, and evaluating from education to international. So a couple of big changes for you. What was? Can you point to one or two things that were the biggest obstacles that you faced? So number one is uh, like applying for federal job. That process was not so clear to me. You know, it required me to actually yeah, study you know, what the process is. And also, um, and also, um, it just the yeah, timing is really different from you know profit or other places I apply. Uh -huh. um, and the other thing is. Uh, because my uh, my resume has been mostly about education program, then I have to kind of uh, make it a little bit more general. And actually, when I was put, when I put my LinkedIn out, uh, actually a couple of recruiters you know contacted me, and one of the most helpful suggestion of this one particular recruiter was you know, he he talk, talked with me. All, over an hour and went over my resume and he suggested you know, for the position he's thinking about you know I should you know, focus on to be more you know general you know, evaluation mm -hmm. and you know I could he helped me to list up like you know did you help in the other project I work he would just provide technical assistance to the program evaluation and I could include that and also uh, I have been for the past three years um, you know, when I actually really think, thinking about it, you know, I should find something else. Um, I kind of started again with Washington Evaluators, which is a professional association in Washington, uh, in Washington area. And they have a pro bono project where you know, we work with nonprofit organizations to come up with an you know, evaluation plan or help their you know, data collection analysis. So I did that, and that kind of gave me more kind of understanding of what, how other programs work. Uh -huh. So it's not like just only doing my thing, but just you know, doing multiple things and then utilizing the resources available for me. Uh -huh. It seems to have helped. Uh, John, you mentioned that the, you were in transition for quite a while. Was that the biggest obstacle? Your, your, your current position, or what, what would you say? It, it was a big obstacle, right? Because again, nowadays companies are looking to bring in people. People are so expensive to bring in 
They want to make sure that you're going to be productive. And they look at what you're doing, like I said, you're really self-employed, and how efficient are you? And that was that was a big obstacle. I, I remember I lost one opportunity because they asked me, so Mr. And here's how they, they do it. They ask you, so how are you spending your time? And that subtle way of saying, you know, you've been in transition a long time. What are you doing? And really, it's a knockout punch because they want to see if you're being inefficient. And I really had to work on that. And see, in, in, in the class, we work on challenging interview questions. Mm -hmm. And that was one that I knew I was going to have to address. And so it was one that, you know, the class is, you know, there's a, a, a structure to the class, but everybody has something that they need to work on. And for me, working on, you know, the answer to that question and, and some other things that I need to work on. But that was certainly one of the more important things. And I, I feel like now, because I, had, I went through that process for me, I'm able to help others, who because I'm also a facilitator, share that experience with the students when they're coming in. Yeah, you prepared for that question. Well, what was your answer? Uh, well, what was it then? What would it be now? All right, so the first time when I lost the job. I mean, literally turn a 20-minute phone interview into a 15-minute phone interview was I said, I'm spending my time looking for a job. And at that point, I think I had been in transition for six months. And this was a very get it done company. And they're looking at, if he can't find a job in six months, we're out of it. So then, after taking the class, I said, all right, I need to be doing something in this time of transition. And in the class, we teach a couple of things. One of them is volunteerism. Another is you know working on your skills. So what I did was I joined the Toastmasters Club. And I don't know, I still a little confused as to how this happened, but they nominated me as president <laughs> of this brand new club, and I had absolutely no experience in Toastmasters. But when I got that question the next time, I was able to say, how are you spending your time? I said, well, I'm using this time to improve my communication and leadership skills. I joined a startup Toastmasters Club and I'm serving as its inaugural president, I spent the last week working on our vision statement. And as soon as I said that, the whole nature of the interview changed. Prior to that, all the questions looked like knockout punches, reasons to not hire John. And immediately after that answer, they started saying, well, Mr. Wilk, no, we want to share with you some of the benefits of joining our firm. Uh -huh. And so that was a big bias. And of course, I got the job offer. And so, but that was just step one in what is a career transition for me. But it was an important step. It was that first job. Now, was it my dream job? In some ways, yes. Some ways, no. It was, it was what I wanted to do, but it was way too far away from home. You know, I had a two-hour commute in the morning uh, that I could not, absolutely could not avoid because I had to drop my son off to daycare. And then I had an hour commute in the evenings only because I was working so late that uh, the traffic had died down by then. But, you know, commuting three hours a day, um, Monday through Friday, plus we were expected to go in on Saturdays. And so I would literally have, on a good week, 17 hours of commuting time on top of um, you know, working a 60 to 70 hour a week job. It wasn't sustainable. So were you looking at that as a uh, stepping stone? It was, it was definitely a stepping stone. I was able to get certified 
pass some licenses. And that was a success bite that I was then able to add. And then the, the second time I went into job transition, because I took that as long as I could. Mm -hmm. It was six months of this incredible schedule that was just wearing me out. I then went into a self-imposed job search, and I landed four jobs in six weeks. Now that's a, a big difference, but the, the value of, the, of taking the class is learning the procedures and building that infrastructure that you need. And once you have that infrastructure built, then it's much easier to go out and be in transition. Mm -hmm. It also gave me the confidence to go ahead and put a self-imposed transition on myself mm -hmm. as opposed to being too afraid because I wouldn't know how long I would get a job. Because again, after I took the class, I landed a new job within two months. Yeah. Which if you really know what you're doing, the two to three month period is really all you need. Mm -hmm. If you really, really know what you're doing, you can get a much shorter period like I did, the, yeah. the multiple job offers in six weeks because you have that infrastructure built. Yeah. Just quickly, and were you applying the second time around? You, you were still working in that. No, I actually yeah. had. I had actually left. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because bold move. it was it was a bold move. Well, it was a bold move, but it was also a calculated move. Yeah. I knew that I was very marketable having passed these certifications, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and so I wanted to, you know, position myself to be available when you know an employer needed me yeah. versus having to say yes. How did you, how, what was the way that you got so many job offers so quickly? Sure, well, again, I, I, you go out to your network and actually someone from my network had um, sent me, one of the job offers came from somebody sending me, uh, you know, this job is open, I think you should apply for it. Um, another job offer, I went out and specifically said this is a company that's in my, my short list. So when you're in the class, you learn how to develop a list of target companies. And so it was one of my target companies. So I went in and met somebody from that company and networked in. That was one job offer. Another job offer I got, uh, I went to a job fair. And again, by this point, I knew how to network. I knew what to say when I was networking. And so this guy was immediately interested in me, <coughs> in the way you articulate your success bites. Um, oh, and, and then, yeah, and, and, and then the fourth one also came from somebody in my natural network, mm -hmm. reaching out. So you primed your network. I, I when I took the class, I had no LinkedIn existence at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I I was starting with ground zero, and through the class, I started building my network or my uh, LinkedIn profile. But then, as I was meeting people, I was adding on to it. And I'm really close now to getting to the magical 500 number. But it's taken me a while because I want to build it organically because I learned the value. There's not just a, uh, there's a difference between having a link and somebody that you don't really know and having a connection in which there is a connection with that person in a relationship. So I'm trying to build my network organically so that I can reach out to it and it's going to be an effective network. And one of the ways I've done that, quite frankly, was volunteering at 40 Plus as a facilitator. We meet a lot of people. You know, we meet between five to seven people each class. We limit it to that number so you get the 40 Plus experience. But I would, I would link in with the, the students and now, because I was helping them, then that's a, and I learned by the way, I learned my networking 
from this guy right yeah. here. He was a facilitator. Yes, you know, believe it or not, I was listening to you <laughs> in, in class, and and I was observing the way you would network. And the way Ken networks is he's going to ask you about yourself. He's going to find out about you before he does even mentions himself. And so I think he had, you know, given me a couple really good ideas. And then I realized, well, oh, geez, now I want to I want to reciprocate because this guy has shared so much information with me. And that's sort of the way you want your network to work. You yeah. know, you want to. I I I like the approach of helping first, and then and, and before you ask. And it's really worked effectively for me. You know, and so now, like I said, I'm closing in on 500, and that's been. Uh, just a little over three years, but it's taken a long time to go to zero to 500. Yeah. What's this magic 500 thing? Uh, you know, that's a sort of arbitrary number that LinkedIn yeah, it used to be status. Yeah, pre-Microsoft, LinkedIn used to have those levels, right, where you'd be professional, all-star, whatever it was. And 500 was the magic number to get your circle completely filled in. And again, this is a few years ago, which you may remember that. So that's where the 500 magic number came from. In the Microsoft, the new paradigm with LinkedIn that's not as relevant, um, but for recruiters that it might still be using an older algorithm, you're still looking for those LinkedIn, for, and if you're not top level in LinkedIn, you are literally invisible to them. So there's still some um, need to be to have the 500 plus number okay. of connections. Well, with the other thing is that they count the number of links, and as you get to 500, then it just says 500 plus. Right, because again, but you can you can check to see how many oh. people right. someone actually actually have in their network by clicking on their connections and they'll give you a list and they'll tell you the number. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's not just 500 plus. It just doesn't list it at the first level. Right. It does list at the first level. It's just because at that point you, you've attained their top level. How about you, Karen? Uh, question, Anna? Yes. Oh. Yes. Um, I My latest LinkedIn connection. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Challenging when we we start a job like if we are not sure if we are going to like it or if we are going to have like distance problems and I don't know you start that working there and maybe after a few months you realize or from the beginning it's not your dream job you had that feeling but it will I don't know it's challenging because uh, employers don't like you to have us to have short experiences, it doesn't look good. So, I don't know, sometimes it's better to wait a little more and be like more secure and start a job than thinking, I'm not sure if I'm going to like it. Maybe I want, in, in one month, I want to quit. Or, and I have to start again looking. I would say, go ahead and take the job. Because <laughs> in any job, you're gonna meet people. <laughs> and you're going to build relationships and those connections. So the, the one thing I do now is when you start a new job, start linking in with everyone because it's sort of like the honeymoon stage and everybody will link in with you. Yeah. And, and what you find is that people now are only staying in jobs for two to maybe three years. Now they're in another company and that might be a company where you would love to have a connection. So, what about the difficulty if you have a job maybe you're only in for a few months? Is that what you're concerned yes. about? Yes. Yeah. And if that's going to look bad to your next employer, it will look like you can't stick with it. I, I think it's going to depend upon why you left. Yeah. And so, one of the things that you want to do is say, all right, I took this job for X reason. Here's what I've learned about myself, and here's what you can expect. And so I'm much better able to make a commitment because now I better know what I'm looking for. And so what you want to do is 
show them the learning process that you went through because they're going to have concerns that you're going to jump, 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 jump. And what you need to do is explain what you learned and why this job is going to be a much better fit for you. But you're going to have to address that. Yes. And sometimes employers like make uh, make the offer very quickly, like, can you start on Monday? Like, <coughs> yes or no right now? And and you, are, you don't know how it's going to be. They are not so clear about how the day is going to be. Again, a lot I of things you're not going to really understand until you try them. Right. And there's this whole concept of fail forward. So you need to try something, understand what it's like, and then, you know, again, even though I took that one job for only six months, I was able to say, look, six months was enough time for me to understand that this is the line of work I want to be in. I passed these certifications so you don't have to pay for that. And so it made me much more valuable the second time around. And I knew I was going to have to to really deal with that commute, you know, because there was no way I was going to be able to move because uh, my son was, you know, just just because of my family situation where my wife works, etc. And so, but I also didn't know how dr grueling it was going to be too. And that was something I was able to speak to in my interviews. It's like, wow, I just underestimated how much commuting 17 to 25 hours a week <laughs> on top of the 60 hour a week work job is going to how it's going to affect me. Yeah. Good. So the job that you had, can you, is that where you, you got some of these certifications? That's where I got all the On their time. Okay. And that was uh, in the insurance? Well, on their time, but I'm also their time. producing. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was, a, it was a tight, they had a very intense training program, uh, which actually also was one of the reasons why I chose them. Uh, again, I have nothing but good things to say about that company. It was Forster's Financial, they're a fantastic company. It was just, I would, I would work for them in a heartbeat if, the, if it wasn't so grueling on me, that commute. It was just, it was just too much. So question, because obviously you had those challenges, you were discovered those challenges, but you, you know you had prioritized why you were going to do this for this time. Right. It's all part of the, the, you know, we learn job search plans, but then you you use those concepts that you gain from the class and you apply it to your career. And that's really what I was doing. I learned the concept and I applied it to my career. And I said, you know, sometimes you, you have to manage your career now. It used to be you would be in one company and there would be training and you would move up. Now you have to take it on yourself to get the training, to get the learning. And they know, they, they'll cut you in a heartbeat if the economy turns. So it, there's a lot less loyalty on both sides now. That's just the new dynamics. And you have to realize this and you have to adapt to this or you're gonna perish. So your 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 then your priorities once you were in there, it was your self education, right. your networking. I was networking. With networking so to keep that still live, right? Yes. And then anything else, or were those two your? Well, I I was learning, you know, the profession mm -hmm. because it was a career change for me. Right. You know, I went from software development to financial advising. And so there, there were a lot of things that were, I was able to use in that background from, from my software development years. And also <coughs> from the fact that I'm a CPA, and so I had that certain knowledge. But <coughs> yes, there was a lot of things that I had to learn. And one of them was the ability to sell. And so in a software development, I was designing, you know, how the software would work. 
but I didn't really have to sell it. That was job of somebody else. And now what I learned, I guess my biggest lesson was I learned now that you really need to learn how to market yourself. And there's not a lot of places that you can learn that, but certainly the 40 plus class is one of them. All right. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. Oh. Okay. All the questions. Oh my yeah. questions. Yeah. Question. I wanted to get to Ken um, and make sure you had a chance to talk about your lessons learned, the biggest obstacle. You said you were stale. You've been working in one nonprofit for 15 years yeah. and came to the job hunt. What, what were the th some of the things you had to uh, overcome? Sure. So it's really about that, about recognizing, as John has said, make the most of your network while you're working. And for those of you who may still be working, um, really capitalize on that. For, for those of us, who, for those of you who might be in transition, you know, try to keep those connections warm if you can. Reach out because, unfortunately, you know, it was just me. But you be, sort of become persona non grata uh, when you're not working, and it's difficult. And the more time that goes on, uh, we all know about the magical six-month perception number, perception factor. Um, so that was difficult to to recognize how hard that was going to be. Um, Fortunately, you know, again, with an organization like 40 Plus uh, to support a community and provide me the opportunity to add some new skills and new experiences. Um, and those led directly to an interim role as a career consultant for Leah Harrison, um, which is a global outplacement organization. Um, I wouldn't have had that opportunity for a couple of different reasons without my experience here at 40 Plus. Um, and that provided a bit of a softer pathway uh, for me while I was continuing my search and as I said, you know, eventually went back to, to the world that I wanted to be in, uh, to what we're to return to. Uh, but as John said, you know, we all have to be looking out for ourselves today. Um, and so when I think about a situation, and Anna, I think you might have been describing a situation where it's a challenging one, and so you have to make that, look, you have to evaluate that trade-off. How much of this challenge can I both tolerate and for how long? And one way that I, you might look at that is, what can, I, what can I, looking about yourself, as John suggested, what can I get out of this that can help me in the future? That could be new skills, that could be exposure to a new community, mm -hmm. the chance to learn a new, new technology in some cases. Uh, and so, to be honest, I'm making that calculus right for myself right now. Because I'm in a situation that isn't going to be ideal for me in the long run, but I'm being able to add new exposure, new experiences to my history that I didn't have before that I think will help me, but got, always have the antenna up um, for those opportunities that, that may be more attractive to you. But it is, it's going to be that day-by-day -day, uh, decision-making trade-off. So. How about resources? Anybody jump in? Oh. Before we get yeah, yeah. I was curious about and hopefully this will be helpful to everyone. Was there one particular resource? Um, you mentioned LinkedIn, of course, that's a, that's a big one. Um, what else? What, what resources for the job might uh, help you all? Okay. For me, as I mentioned, I'm in the association world. So uh, for any of you who might be in, in any t specific professional discipline, turn to your, look at your association. There's probably a professional organization that supports your development or a trade association that's active in your space, whether it's information technology or uh, marketing or whatever it might be. All of those organizations have job boards. All of those organizations have publications. All of those organizations have professional development opportunities, some of which may be online and free. And it's a way to, to raise your profile within that space. Um, so, you know, again, turn to that. I've seen it work for many people to be more active in, in, in that area. Uh, and then just, uh, John mentioned this as well. I'm a, I'm a, I go all in with volunteering. Um, I, I attended one, I was in this audience once. And afterwards, I found the gentleman who was facilitating and I signed up for the class. And I think I've been pretty much all in 40 plus for the last three years. Um, and so I'm also very active in other volunteer activities because it gives me the opportunity to get exposed to different kinds of organizations, to bring some of the skills that I've developed over the years to them. And these are often cause-oriented organizations that might not have the resources to think about strategic planning, board development, strategic partnerships, and so forth. Those are things that I've worked on, and I can bring that experience to them. And that's created new awareness for me of opportunities uh, in a different part of the, the workforce that I wouldn't have been aware of otherwise. So be open to those volunteer opportunities. Mika. 
Uh, how about you? Yeah. There any resources or what's so, up? Um, so, uh, and as you know, I have been like trying to find something for like over three years. And I think what really helped me was uh, having job club, which is, you know, we graduated from a uh, poly class and we are still meeting. Because before that, my network is still a professional network. And everybody is evaluators, and there are only a small number of people are hiring, you know, for me. So, uh, the one example of how job club was helpful was. That was the, just a day, that morning, when I was having an interview with uh, one place, and my job club member called me and said, you know, there is a publicly available website of the specific office, and you know, you should look at this, and you should look, at, look into some of the case studies they have. And, uh, you know, it's, yeah, usually those specific office is, really difficult to find, even that's in publicly available, in, public, in the public domain. But I read that, and then when I went to interview, you know, I could really imagine you know, what that work is. And that really helped me to, you know, the interview was like really, I, I felt like I'm really familiar there. But I also think that, you know, if that wasn't told by job club member, because we work together and we have, you know, high trust, you know, we have trust, trust relationships. So, if that's just, you know, I read from the like, you know, website saying you should be looking at the you know, website. No, it's a different level of, you know, engagement for me. So, and that really helps me. Do I get the same question? No. <laughs> <laughs> what question do you want to answer, Joe? No, I want to answer that same, same question because I'm going to say the same for me, the, it, 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 the, the main resource was the job club. And, and the reason is because you don't know who you're going to get in your job club, but they're going to be good people. And one of my, one of the people in my job club had actually been an Emmy Award winning writer. And so, now who do you think I went to for help? <laughs> when I, I had some tough wording issues. And she also volunteers here. And so that was a wonderful thing. But what I like to see is that it's, you have two of your classmates came to see you when you fell today, right? So we, we talk about two types of clubs. Job clubs, which is you stick together until everybody finds a job and then success clubs, and we give you the option. In the last two classes, including the guys in the back there, chose the success club, which is, you know, you, you have this bonding experience because you're gonna get to learn and share information with this group of people, and they know you. They know your strengths and weaknesses. They're real strong connections because there are links in, in your profile, in your LinkedIn profile, because they know you. They can speak eloquently about your strengths and weaknesses and things. And there's a certain code, and that code is confidentiality. So anything you say in your, your class is held to be confident, and everybody knows that. So you can experiment, and so you don't want to be experimenting with answers to challenging interview questions when you're in an important interview. But you can bounce them off of your classmates and you can see their reaction. And see, there are also people who are currently in the job search. So they understand the challenges that you're going through. So it is a, truly a bonding experience. And I love to see that in the class. And I can tell you, anytime somebody, and I took the class three years ago, anytime somebody from my uh, job, job club sends me an email or gives me a call, I'm picking it up. And so, yes. What's the difference between a job club and a success club? Well, a job club is you're, you agree to stick together until you all find jobs. A success club is, you know, even after we find jobs, there's going to be issues that we need to work through, such as coping with a new co corporate culture, 
maybe a difficult boss, all sort of issues that you're going to have to to address. And if you're in a success club, you guys are all staying together because you know each other and you you have this tight unit of people working together. So you're not feeling like you're alone. And that was to me when I was in the job search was the worst feeling was the isolation. But now I know I always have this job club that I can always call on. And you know, it may be, again, now it might be an issue that I'm having at a company, you know, oh, I don't like to co-worker, why? What do, you, what do you think about this? And you can, and you know that it's gonna be confidential, and you know that they know you, and they're gonna give you honest feedback. And so that's very helpful. Is so neat, or just like, as needed to call someone? Um, well, again, if you have a success club formally, because success club is something I came up with after volunteering okay. for a while. Uh, when I was going through, we only had job clubs. And so then, and I see Tom with Who wants to say something? <laughs> yeah, I just want to, if I may, uh, uh, give you the definition of what a job club really is. I mean, traditionally, a job club is a group of people that get together, maybe sponsored by a church or another organization, and the purpose is for them to get together to understand how to write their resume, practice interviewing skills. Everything that we do in the class generally happens in a job club, okay, traditionally. So it's better that we're calling it a success club because, you know, the job clubs that are formed after the class uh, adjourns, uh, everyone has those skills, so it's now you know you can practice with each other, but but it's basically um, the idea to more to network and to help each other understand you know the directions to go in to find opportunities. So, Whereas the success yeah. club yeah. is going to go one step further, right. then, and then, you're going to start talking about issues like career management and strategic things that you can do. How am I going to get this? You know. Your job club might identify, hey, this is one of your weaknesses, this is an area. Well, how am I going to get that experience? Well, you could volunteer here or you could do that. And at 40 plus, one of the things we try to do is when you volunteer, I'm going to ask you, all right, what is your, what is your goal? What do you really want to get out of this experience? And what will help you in your job search? And it's because of the whole mentality, success by mentality. And I see that the man, the, the success by man is <laughs> back. Yeah. And it's nice to see you here. I'm yeah, and, and you know, this is kind of your unique <laughs> uh, And again, it's also fun to see the growth in the class when you volunteer at 40 plus, because I can see from the, you know, oftentimes I work with the pre-assessments because I want to see how people are, what their baseline is when they start, and then I, I help with the post-assessments too because I love to see how far they've come. Yes? Did you, did you move? I did. <laughs> um, I wanted to say this has been really, truly very helpful. It has been incredible. I got so much out of it, that, and more than I expected, which obviously is always, you know, excellent. But I'm in the same decision where you are right now, where you talk about finding a job, and then how do you manage your career? How do you manage your day to day? Right. Do not stop working, right? And so it resonated incredibly for me. I'm on week three. It's a totally different culture. <laughs> I've 18 years right. uh, of my previous company. So, so I feel more centered to not just, like you said, endure, right. because the current choice is fabulous, but there's a lot of adaptation that I have to take. I have to adapt, but I also have to work towards, a, towards my own mission and goal. So I really thought this was very good, and I found it quite helpful. Well, don't you and, and, and realize that you can take the class well, you have a job, so, yes, and it, right. you're going to work on different issues, but it's something that you should consider. Absolutely. And, and especially because then you'll 
what we tend to see is people who have taken the class tend to do better in their next job and faster. to speak and faster. Yeah, it's. No, so I wanted to let you guys know it was right. very good. But you're leaving. Why are you leaving? I know because I have to go back to the All right. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Yeah, I have, I have a question uh, uh, for, for everybody, but I guess uh, we can start with you because you, you mentioned um, volunteerism, yep. and I wanted to explore that a little further. So um, I'm trying to frame my question. So it makes what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to ask is uh, volunteering at what? So, by which I mean, to make another kind of a rough analogy here, and then, so Anna, you were talking about like, okay, a job that maybe it's not perfect for you, okay, maybe we'll apply that to the volunteering, sure. right? Is it, I mean, volunteering is, 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 is giving of your time and services for someone else's right. benefit, succinctly put. So, how, I mean, is it better to just volunteer wherever to help people, or should, is it volunteering like you should really be managing your volunteering too yeah. to pick out specifically something that's going to? It's a bit about I don't want to selfish, but right. you know, redound to your benefit. Sure. Too. It depends on what your goals are. I mean, if you're someone who's particularly passionate about a cause right. or an organization, go do that because that's going to make you feel good. But competency-based volunteering is a completely different situation, and that's really a little bit about what I was referring to. So there are opportunities to apply your competencies, your skills, to organizations that need them. And there's a ton of groups in this area that can do that. If you want to get started really simply, there's a, a website, volunteermatch.org, that's going to have the spectrum. You're going to be able to read to, to the elderly, or to young kids, to your young kids, if that's what you want to do and all that. Note that that's really sort of a cause-oriented volunteering. But then two organizations that I've been involved in are Compass, Compass Pro Bono, and the Taproot Foundation. Those are more competency-based or skill-based volunteering opportunities. There's an application process, there's a matchmaking process where you tell them what you think you're capable of bringing to the volunteer experience, and they have organizations that need, may need that kind of help. I found those to be particularly rewarding. It expands your network, it exposes, for me, it exposes me to a different component of the nonprofit community uh, and areas that, that needed some help. And so that's more, that's widened my, the scope of my search somewhat. It's also educated me to the limitations that I might have in pursuing opportunities in that area, because primarily about the ability to fundraise, which perhaps isn't something that I'm particularly good at. So there are many different ways, but I would think about skill-based volunteering, companies-based based volunteering, as a way to kind of more substantially build, build a network. I follow on that totally quickly. Sure. So, with regard to the last two, for Compass and Taproot, you mentioned something like a skills assessment or, mm -hmm. or a vetting mm -hmm. process or mm -hmm. something. And then, okay, so is that is that beyond things where you may have a piece of paper or a certificate or something? Is it also that they would be able to vet because you may have things just in your life or in your work experience, but which you don't have some piece of paper sure. for that would actually be useful in a volunteer situation? I think every situation is different, and okay. I think you got to sort of put it on paper first, right. and then start a conversation with them, demonstrate okay. things that might not otherwise be there. So. Mika had a, a pro bono experience, I think, that we yeah. might go to that. Would you talk about yes, that? and actually, that would be my work for this week. I would just spend most of my time on that. So I'm a part of Washington Evaluators, which is a professional organization here. And they have, a, they call it uh, Evaluators Without Borders, basically. They send evaluators with different skills and match with uh, non-profit organizations. And we provide evaluation support. For example, this week, uh, I have been working with other evaluators to look into uh, performance measurement outcome indicators for uh, Washington area Washington area community investment fund. Uh, so I have been working with them. And I think it, it's a good opportunity for for example, you know, for 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 me because I my area of evaluation has been pretty much limited in education for the past six years. And also uh, I think it's a good 
the way for everybody to just feel and also you know, they can build the experience like actually working in, in the DC organization. So you're getting experience evaluating different mm -hmm. programs from education. Yeah. Yeah. And also it's and good, yeah, good to work with other people because you know, once I do work with others, you know, I can feel like I can ask more. I can actually ask and they can ask me. So I know how you know, other people work. So and that's volunteering through a professional organization yes. directly in your field. So yeah. Okay. Hey. Hey, folks. Yeah. Yes? I have a question about the volunteering. I've been doing some of that. Um, with the organizations that do work that I'm interested in, and I produced like this report, which was served to some public officials. And sometimes I worry that, well, I mean, in this particular group I'm working with, it seems like a lot of other people there, they're involved because it somehow relates to professional interests. Some people, it's more just, they're interested in it and they don't really have a professional sure. job. But it seems like, well, sometimes it's like, wow, you got to watch out because if they know all you're doing, you know, if you're only doing it for professional reasons, like, oh, does that person... I don't understand. If you're actually not really doing it to help them, but to help yourself, is that a problem? As long as you bring the skills to the table. No, I understand that. Right. Even then, though, because it seems like, ah... I, I think it's going to depend problem. upon the the culture of the organization. Yeah. Now, at forty plus, we want we're looking for win-win opportunities. Of course. Right. I want to make sure that if you volunteer here, you're getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, because I know that we're an all-volunteer organization. In order for us to survive, I have to provide something to you. Of course. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna have a different process, right? We're gonna have a sit down, and we're gonna we're gonna come up and with a plan. It could be that I say, I'm sorry, we just have nothing that that will help you, and we'll walk away from it, you know. Uh, but for me, it has to be a win-win situation, or else I don't want you to do it. The other thing I don't want you to do is volunteer so much that it interferes with your job search. And I've seen that. And so yeah. at, at 40 plus, except for Fred, Ron, <laughs> and me, and Ken, and you'll find that out later today. Uh, <laughs> no, it, you know, we try to limit the scope and give you a, a specific thing to work on so that, because we know that you could leave as soon as you find a job. You may not have a choice, right? And like and I said, it could be something where you know, you're, you're an accountant and you're bringing your accounting skills, great, we need that, thank you, we love it. Or you could be an accountant, but you've never, you really want to bolster your public speaking. Sure. Again, we have those opportunities too. The needs are many and the hands are few. So, you know, there's, there's either of those opportunities are here. And we're gonna match, we're gonna find out what you need, what strategically is gonna work for you. But again, the, the benefit of taking the class is that you're, you're coming into a community, right, where people know each other. You know, like Tom and I have been facilitating day H for three years now. And so he knows a lot about my strengths and weaknesses. And he can give me very good feedback that nobody else will. But I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Aaron volunteers for us. And if Aaron needs somebody to give him a recommendation, he can come to me and instead of saying, yeah, he, he's volunteered here, I can say, oh, I was really impressed by this one instance where I came up with a question for our survey and he said, John, you have too many options that you're going to, you're, you're giving the people and it's going to distort your data. We need to to combine it into you know bigger classes so we get more meaningful data. Now that's a very good recommendation because it's very specific to the company. And they're gonna say, oh wow. And I can say, I sit in meetings with him and I love the the quality of his his comments. 
and I can say it earnestly, and I can come up with specific examples. And that's the difference. So the more specific the example is, somebody can, you know, one problem that we see in a lot of the pre-assessments are people making claims. I'm a proactive person, or I'm a good communicator, but they don't really back it up with evidence. And what you learn in the class is that the more specific you are, the more uh, persuasive it is. And so that's what you work on in the class. And it's a skill, it's a skill, yeah, it's a skill that you, it, it takes practice. And we provide a real safe environment in which to get that practice. How about any questions? You know, you've got three folks up here that one way or another have gone through some transitions, all of you have probably gone through transitions. Are there points that you're, you're struggling with, things that you need some help with? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I have a question. Yes. I've done a lot of networking and I'm still looking for a full-time job and doing some consulting, which is really good. Um, so one thing I want to do is turn one of these consulting things into a job, uh -huh. if anyone has any insights on that. And I guess the other thing is like, how to know what, how much to use your network, and it seems like sometimes, you know, maybe the network gets stale, maybe it gets too hot. Too hot. You're too. You're there. Oh, like, you want to be in their face every day, right? Oh, I know that, but I just like if people are like, oh, I've been looking for a job for a while. What's going on? And then, in one case, I'm getting involved with this kind of quasi volunteer work, but there's a job, possible job component to it. And then I asked, well, I told someone about a job at the organization. She wasn't the hiring manager. And didn't hear anything. And I was like, oh no, like. It seems like, you know, sometimes like you can get too close. And your network is like, oh, I'm gonna help you in this way, but not in this way. Well and, and I manage and that. Like, well, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well here, here I will address it. How much can you ask of your network? Like basically I wanna work with this organization. How much goodwill have you built up okay. with your network? And yeah. that's that's gonna really be the driver. You know. And that's why I said I grow my network organically. And I grow it by helping first. Of course. And then, then I have all these deposits in different places. So now, if you are developing a network when you're needy, that's different than developing a network when you have things to offer. And so a lot of people are trying to develop their network when they're needy. So, you have to break this mentality of give me, give me, give me, and go back to what can I offer you okay. and, and, and build it up. Oh so, no, but in this case, I am offering something, and I was on the phone with this person, like, oh, if this organization, basically talking about a new project, and they said, oh, maybe Adam, you could be the person for this, like a part-time job. And then a week later, I found out this other job at this person's organization, and I said, I just want to let you know I'm applying. I didn't hear anything. It was like, well, she obviously was considering me for a job that she would sort of have influence over the hiring them. And then I, shortly after that, I said, oh, what about this other thing? Like, here's another thing. Yeah. All right, so, so again, there's an instance where you were being a little bit greedy, it looks like. You were trying to say, this is what would benefit me and not look taking care of the needs of the organization for her to say, is that, could that be Maybe. the perception? I mean, that's the way it sounds to me. And so, well, but I would just add that the first thing where she said, oh, you could do this job that we could raise money for, I was kind of leading or helping lead this effort to kind of, kind of like almost create a little trade association. So I was trying to give back, so to speak. And she, without me saying anything, said, oh, maybe you could do this. I'm like, great. And then, then did you take it to the next step and perhaps sketch out a proposal or well I know that we had this follow-up call and then I volunteered to help that move that process along. But in the middle there, this other job came up related, well, the same organization but a different job in here. And I just said, Oh, I want to let you know I'm applying. I didn't even ask for anything. And it just was like no response. I'm like, oh no, okay. 
Regarding the consulting, um, you've probably seen a lot of speakers here at 40 plus that have that kind of put out their own flag. Um, so those can be great resources. Also, we are friends with the Institute of Management Consultants, which is a startup organization, you know, membership organization here in DC. And that's exactly what they do, is they help people that are starting or considering branching out on their own, uh, help them evaluate the, you know, the viability of what they would propose to do, how to get it started, how to strike a balance between business development, serving your clients, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. They have a monthly, usually monthly, probably take August off, little mixer um, oh. on you know, getting to know them and getting to know what they offer. So take a look at that, imcusa.org. Uh, Our friend Linda Howard is the past president of that chapter. Um, so it could be a group for folks that are considering you know, putting out their own shingle. And there's, have you ever heard of SCORE? No. Look up SCORE. Uh, they're, they- S C O R E. Mm -hmm. S C O R E. yeah. Service Core of Retired Executives. Yes. And they're looking to give back and so they can mentor you as you go through because there's a lot involved with starting your own business. Um, I was going to take your, your, your scenario and maybe rephrase it into a more generic question. So, you know, you mentioned uh, giving people at 40 plus if people volunteer, you can a discrete task to work on, and you're aware that it's volunteer, and so if they get a, a, a job, they may have to drop that. That's right. Okay. So, so what I'm hearing maybe was a, a more generic way to say it is, so in your network, if you uh, express an interest to fill as a volunteer, or maybe it's not even volunteer, but as a, as a, as a short-term contract job, in your network where there's a need, um, balancing the risk then, that if, particularly if that was in a larger organization which may have other departments, that you may separately and parallelly apply for a full-time position in that same organization. Oh. The person that you initially offered your time to now is saying, well, wait a minute. Well, you, yeah, this you, is where yeah. communication is important. That's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, First of all, if you're volunteering at 40 plus, I don't want you just to leave us hanging. So I will be up front and say, you know, at a minimum, I need this. And then I would hope that we could work out a transition plan on the back end. But I understand that your primary job is to find a job, right? And so I'm not going to preclude using your talents, I wanted to encourage that because it's a win-win situation. But again, it's all about the discussion that you have and you have to be very clear. You don't want to leave, the worst thing you can do is leave someone with bad taste. And so that's turning a negative and we don't, we don't right. want to do that. Right. So yes, it's being very clear, clear up front. Being clear. Life. The with the pop so if somebody tells me, you know, John, if I if I get a job, I might not be able to do this. I said, I understand. Let's also talk about what we can do to maybe document what you're doing as you're volunteering, so that if I need to put somebody in there, there's a smooth transition. So there's things that you can do. There are things that you can offer, but yeah, don't don't leave somebody hanging. Now in this situation, you said, oh, there's a full-time job in this organization, which, by the way, is great because that means you're networking within that organization and you're meeting new people. At that point, then you need to have a discussion with the person you're currently helping, saying, look, I'm very interested in this position. How would that impact you? Is there a way that we can work together? Now, all of a sudden, you've turned what could be a sticky situation into a collaborative situation, right. and that's going to make you an even stronger candidate. So that's what you want. That's the way you want to handle that. Yes. So for both, I guess, you, John, and Mika, you both, in some ways, have, are, went to different, kind of transitioned into a different type of job or different type of an organization than what you had been doing for many, many years. 
So what would you say, what were you able to do, what did you do to be able to get that attention so that these folks would even consider interviewing or ultimately employing you even though your resume may not have been what they were, thought they were looking for? I like it. So for, for federal process, this is what I love. Resume is very important. So, and, and actually I have a couple of my evaluation colleagues who are also, you know, uh, applying for federal work. So we, you know, those people have to send me, you know, here is the resource you might want to, you know, look at, you know, there is a document you want to look at. So. But um, resume was very important, so I, I think I kind of spent a lot of time in making sure the keyword is there and the level of complexity of my work I did really reflects the level of complexity they are looking for. Mm. So, and once you create that, you know, depending on how job description was, you know, I you know, changed it. So actually, it's, it's a lot of work. But resume was really important. Um, when you mentioned before about talking about your experiences in a more of a general sense, yeah. instead of specific to education, so that you could talk about what was relevant to, to the new So, like, there is a transferable skills, and each job, what I understood is each, each job series has, like, you know, those are the you know, key competencies. You have to move. So, I, yeah, and, and you know, I try to like link uh, my experience with that. You know, like when I was writing about the research project, you know, that should include as research management and you know, stakeholder involvement. So, those things would be you know, yeah. Yeah. So, and I think, yeah, I think there is a transferable skills, and I would try to like emphasize yeah. that. Companies, competencies mm -hmm. instead of the specific area that you're applying yeah. to. So for me, I went out and did some research, informational interviews, and uh, one gentleman worked with Edward Jones, and he was very, you know, I, I didn't know him, I just called him out of the blue. And he was very good about meeting with me because he's in a networking business. And we had a very good discussion. And he told me, he, he literally gave me the game plan, you know, of what I needed to do. And so I just started executing on the things that he told me during that informational interview. And that was very key because then when I got to the interview process, I knew what sort of things to, to highlight. And for me, bringing up that I was in Toastmasters was very important because then they know, knew I was going out and meeting a lot of people and that I'm outgoing and these are things that they want to see. So it was very strategic, and it, but it all started with informational interview for me. So how did you get the interview in the first place? Oh, uh, with the informational interview? No, 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 the job interview. So you went, if I understand, from software to insurance. So presumably an insurance company is looking at, okay, he never did anything in insurance, so why am I even looking if it even got to that point? So what do you think prompted them to even call you in for the interview in the first place? Let's put it that way. What? Uh, all right, so it, it was a different company that I got the interview with. And so what I did was I used the knowledge that I got from the gentleman from uh, Edward Jones, and I, I applied that to Forrester's when I, I saw an opening for them, and I saw that opening at a job fair. But see, I knew the game plan. Mm -hmm. So I knew what to say, I knew what to do, I knew what to include, what to include in my cover letter, et cetera, to highlight these are the important areas, and it worked, you know, they were interested. And then Tom, I got a, oh, okay, he's in the back. Tom gave me a, 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 a rate, you know, recommendation. He was at, at, on the spot because we were at the job fair together. We were working it for 40 plus. And um, 
just happened to be there. And again, this was being opportunistic, right? I'm volunteering, and all of a sudden, I, I get an opportunity to apply for a job that I like. I'm like, oh, geez, I, who would have known? I didn't know that going in. But it just all worked out, and we were all vendors, and we were all breaking down and leaving together. And Tom struck up a conversation with one of the gentlemen who worked at the company and said, take a look at his resume. And so, you know, and, and that helped because that was that endorsement. And that's part of being a part of the community too, right? By that point, I have been nested with 40 plus because I had taken the class, I'd come to some of the Monday morning meetings, I had volunteered, I'd taken the class, and I'm a part of the community. And once you're in the community, we're all working together. So it's a great network, it, especially you guys who just graduated the class. You need to know that you can tap into any of the former graduates because they've been there and you've got that thing in common and they're going to help you. It's all, you know, being a community and sticking together. And that's when we said yes. Yeah, can I just expand on that <laughs> briefly? <laughs> I took the class in 2002. Last Saturday night, um, a group of us got together at a dinner party, and one of the members of our dinner party was someone I met when I took the class in 2002, okay? We remained friends throughout the years. Why is this, okay, so what caused this friendship to uh, become important? I was a, uh, back then in 2002, I'd been a, I was a corporate recruiter in government contracts, DOD and intelligence community. 9-11 happened, all recruiting ended. So I uh, came to 40 plus, you know, I was laid off as all the recruiters were. And I came to some Monday classes. And I had used 40 plus actually in my affirmative action plan. Back then the class was two weeks, five days a week, you know, nine to five. So it was very intense. <clears throat> One of the members of the class, Ken, he had been laid off in telecommunications. Uh, he was in marketing, telecommunications was going down at that time. Okay, during the, the class, he expressed an interest in building or developing, starting his own insurance company, okay? I was a silent partner in a uh, software services company. We won a contract with DIA to build systems and counterintelligence. I had to go out and hire 20, 25 people. I called Ken and said, did you start your agency? He said, yes. I said, fine, come in and talk. I need to insure my new employees. So that, I was able to actually give him a head start on you know, building his insurance agency. So we remain friends all these years, you know, because uh, we have that connection. And, we, and Tom, you took the class 17 years ago. Right. Right, and last and Saturday night, connected. Ken and I got together as part, you know, the group. Yeah. And he's still so connected with 40 yeah. plus. Yeah. So that tells you something. <laughs> you know, you don't hang around an organization right. for 17 years if it doesn't mean something to you. Right. The other thing I mentioned. 10 years. 10, 10, <laughs> 10, 10, 10, 10 years. Right? But Ken, Ken built a successful company, and now he's, uh, he's, he's turning, what, 67 in... Uh, in October, and he's looking to sell it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, he's really. Uh, but it was because of forty plus mm -hmm. people said, "What have you got to lose? Mm -hmm. You want to try this? Go out and do it." Mm -hmm. So you got to get out there and make things. So his happen. class encouraged him to. Absolutely, start. that's the whole point. And then I was able to bring him in and uh, build, help build. Uh, All right. Build so my business. my career transition also occurred because of something someone in my class said. She's like, you know, life's short, yeah. and you need to do what you want to do. And she's like, you're in a stage of your life where, you know, you can afford to take the, the startup costs of starting your own business. Go for it, or else you're going to have regrets the rest of your life. Uh, I just want to share a recent experience. Um, John, can I? Um, break in here and I think we need to wrap up the full part and thank the panel and then by all means keep the Q&A going uh, one on one but uh, 
being at the we brought it over, I just want to thank you all for coming. Yeah. Congratulations again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.